Afghanistan. Rubriken för det här samtalet är Afghanistan, barnens rättigheter och talibanernas åtkomst. Det är ett samtal där vi har Anna Ek, Svenska Afghanistankommitténs Sverigechef. Vi har Athena Rayburn som jobbar för att rädda barnen i Afghanistan. Och samtalet leds av Lisa Nordström som är policyrådgivare på Rädda barnen. Varsågoda. Tack och... Tack och välkomna allihopa. Thank you very much for joining this. My name is, as was announced earlier, Lisa Nordström and I will be facilitating these conversations together with our two guests that I will introduce to you shortly. Um, you're also free to post questions in the chat box if you're following this conversation and we will try and answer them either during the conversation or after, depending on time. So after 20 years, uh, US and NATO pulled out of Afghanistan a month ago. The Taliban have announced a sort of an interim government since. And Save the Children and the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan have been in Afghanistan doing the work for since the 70s, 80s. So the question today is what will now happen? Will these organizations be able to continue their work? Uh, how will this impact on children's rights and their access to education? Those are some of the topics we will turn to today in our discussion. Before we begin, I'd just like to introduce, give a little bit of background to Afghanistan, whom some of you may know very well, but for others, perhaps a reminder. Four decades of conflict, recurrent natural disasters, including drought, has been the reality in Afghanistan. Add to that the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, which have created an acute humanitarian needs for Afghanistan and the population. Women and children have been in particularly uh, hard affected and children growing up in Afghanistan have seen nothing but conflict for all of their lives. Since the onset of this crisis, the World Health Organization have not been able to deliver important health supplies and many, many um, countries uh, have inhibited, suspended their aid, including the World Bank. This, of course, is a serious impact and has been um, resulting in an unprecedented disruption to life-saving health services throughout the, the country. Uh, another number which is a bit staggering is that more than half of all under five-year-olds are suffering from malnutrition. This is a daunting situation by any measure. And I will now turn to Anna and Athena. Warmly, warmly welcome to this discussion. Um, Anna, you represent uh, the Swedish Committee for Afghanistan in this um, discussion. Can I start with you? The Taliban's return to power. What do you think it will mean for children's rights in Afghanistan? Oh, there's so many thoughts going around in my head, <laughs> I think. Um, I think I'd like to start by just reflecting back. Um, the last 15 to 20 years has meant an explosion of the number of students in school. Uh, young girls and boys, the fact that girls have been able to return to school means that there is an acceptance from both the mother and the father. There has been um, a revolution in terms of norms, accepting and actually promoting uh, women's and girls' rights to, for example, education. Now, if the Taliban should insert a complete ban on women's possibility to work, uh, girls going to school, um, it will have severe impact, of course, on their lives. But I think also it will mean that boys and brothers won't be see their mothers and sisters being part of society. Uh, it will have huge effects if that would happen. We're not there yet. Uh, we are in a situation of a lot, lot of uncertainties. Um, another answer to your question, uh, relating to what you mentioned in the introduction, the cut of financial transfer transfers to Afghanistan means that, as of today, uh, only 5% of the families in Afghanistan go to bed with food in their stomach. The rest go to bed hungry. Um, and what that means, for example, for your possibility to learn in school, we all know it, it, will, it, will, it will impact your learning, but of course also in the long term it will increase the need, the even more increase the need for humanitarian assistance. Um, as you also mentioned, 
uh, almost half of the children below age five are already undernourished. Uh, I have more examples, but I think I'll pause for there. Yeah, we'll come back yeah. to them, Anna. Thank you for that uh, co first comment. Athena, much welcome. Athena Rayburn, our advocacy director from the Afghanistan office. Um, we talked about the fact that this has been a very particular hard hit for women and children. And the Taliban initially said that women and girls would be able to continue their education and go to school. But over the weekend, we just heard some uh, different uh, announcements on that, uh, that girls would not be returning to secondary school. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's an excellent question, and I'll start with the obvious. Um, it would be devastating for children not to be able to go to school. Um, education is a life-saving intervention, especially after conflict and the impact of COVID-19, which shut schools in Afghanistan for over a year. And something to remember is that education is not and never only is about children's growth and development, especially in a context like Afghanistan. It's also about their mental health and their safety. There's no way around it that preventing girls from returning to school is a, is a direct violation of their rights. And it would also make Afghanistan the only country on earth to bar half the population from further education. There are also knock-on effects of not being allowed to go to schools. Anna mentioned, how will girls and women fully participate in society? It undermines their economic empowerment and in the long run will compromise women's access to services. In Afghanistan, most services are already sex segregated and we're already seeing requests from the authorities on the ground, for example, in health to say that female patients should only be seen by female doctors. How will we have female doctors going forward in the years to come if girls can't go to secondary school? While they have the Taliban leadership have stated so far that this is a temporary suspension while they figure out what they would believe to be, you know, what they need to make school a safe environment for girls. We absolutely have to make sure that we don't take our eyes off this issue. They are the leadership now in power in Afghanistan, and they are directly responsible for ensuring the application of human rights. Girls absolutely must be allowed to go to school. Or this would have devastating impacts on the country as a whole. Hmm. Thank you. Very serious situation already. But this is not the only challenge, of course. What is the current situation when it comes to female staff and how does that affect your possibilities for res resuming activities and interventions? Another, another really important question. So we operate uh, with you know, a huge number. We have almost 2,000 staff in Afghanistan. 99% of those are Afghan staff and the vast majority of our field staff, our community-based staff are women. They are absolutely essential. What we've seen since the Taliban took control is that we've not had blanket approval to move forward with our female staff at, in different provinces. We work and at present in over 10 oper in provinces in Afghanistan. And what we've had to do is work at provincial by provincial level, working across different sectors, so education, health, uh, nutrition, to get agreements that will allow our female staff to continue their work. There are some agencies that have started sooner than us because they've resumed services without female staff. And for us, that's simply not an option. We stand in solidarity and respect for the incredible work that our female staff do, but it is actually about more than that. It's about our ability to deliver services and reach vulnerable populations. You might in the short term be able to reach people faster with that female staff, but the fact is in the long term, you lose access to the most vulnerable groups in Afghanistan. As an example, the recent numbers on displacement show there are 5.5 million Afghans displaced in the country. And we're also starting to prepare for winter. Temperatures drop below freezing over the Afghan winter, and those who are displaced are often without shelter, food, or any access to services. And this displacement has been caused by a combination of factors, including the recent drought and the conflict. The vast majority of those who are displaced are women and children, and they are incredibly vulnerable. Not only do they lack access to basic services, but children will be out of school and the protection risks are huge. So things like increased risk of violence, trafficking, sexual and gender based violence, child labor and other forms of abuse. And the fact is, we will not be able to reach those women or those children without female staff. As I said earlier, we're already seeing requests that female patients are only seen by female doctors. You can't reach women without women, especially with the current leadership. So. Without their work and without those permissions to make sure that we can use our female staff across the country, lives will be lost in Afghanistan. 
That's a very daunting uh, future you're painting, though. Women can't be reached without women. So what is the current situation for your respective organizations when it comes to the work on the ground now? Anna, if I can turn to you, what does it look like for you now? Can you operate and what does that look like and what are you hearing from people on the ground? Yeah, let me start by picking up what uh, Athena said, you can't reach women without women. Uh, we're actually using that as an argument to keep girls' and women's schools open, because without doctors, you, to, to become a doctor, you have to complete, have, have a complete education before that. So that is actually an argument we have, been used, we have used it before, and we will keep using it. <coughs> uh, in general, we saw during the first weeks from the Taliban takeover, we saw a lot of women self-imposing restrictions on themselves. Uh, because, of course, taking precautionary measures, I think everyone could relate to that. Um, we have returning female staff to the offices. Um, some of them have kept working as before. For example, in our healthcare interventions, from day one, the Taliban made sure that uh, they were making a clear standpoint that please keep coming to work because they realize that they depend on NGOs such as ours uh, in order to keep the hospitals open because they have no capacity themselves. So female staff working in the healthcare system in general have been working as before. Now, the problem for men and women uh, is still uh, salaries. We're running out of medicines. There's no fuel for ambulances and so on. Uh, and that, of course, will affect also women that will be in need of healthcare. Um, uh, we've also examples of um, some of our field staff are recruited as couples. So both the man, uh, the husband and the wife, they work together in the field operations. And that is also a method that we have occupied since before or used since before. Uh, and it's, it's working at the moment, at least. Um, they are, of the, the Taliban are, of course, expecting from all NGOs uh, or other workplaces in Afghanistan to separate men and women in the offices, um, for the women to be accompanied by a man if they are traveling and so on. It's not entirely new. Uh, we've seen this before, even when the previous government was in power. Uh, but I think it's these kind of adaptations that no one is really sure how much we are needing to adapt. It's a trial and error phase, I would say. Um, Women are testing, could I wear a little less hijab? Oh no, I have to take a little more. No, I can take it off when I'm at the office, etc. Um, so uh, yeah, it's in general, we are continuing as before and women are returning to office and to work. Mm. Thank you, Anna. And Athena, what's the situation for Save the Children's intervention currently, today? How are you operating and where and how is that working for you? And what are you hearing from people? So, as I said, we've had to, we were suspended pretty much almost entirely from August 15th and have been working to secure those approvals. Um, and we've been waiting until we have approval for female staff to work both in the frontline front line delivery of programs and also in the office. Last year, we, last week, sorry, we were able to restart our mobile health teams in Kandahar, which is actually using a majority female team. We have midwives, we have mental health and psychosocial support staff, we have doctors, we have those working on vaccinations, we have those working on nutrition support as well. One of the most concerning things that we have seen already from the resumption of our health services is the sky high rate of acute and severe malnourishment. Afghanistan was already one of the highest countries in terms of food insecurity on the earth, second only after Yemen. And before we were forced to suspend, we were already seeing really incredibly high levels of malnourishment among children. And a lot of this is being driven by the conflict and driven by the drought. Now, without a month of services, and many agencies still have not resumed fully, and with the huge trouble we're having in terms of being able to access populations because we don't have agreements to do so, and the sheer problem of cash, most banks in Afghanistan are still closed. Some are allowing withdrawals of up to 200 USD a week. It's difficult to pay suppliers, pay our staff. And while our finance team has done an incredible job of making sure we're moving past some of those obstacles, there, there's a huge barrier in that the scale of the crisis in Afghanistan has only increased. 
we have a huge hunger crisis, we have huge levels of displacement, we have millions of children that are still out of school, and we have a severe lack of access to protection services and health services, part of that, of course, caused by the World Bank freezing their assistance to Afghanistan. So what we're hearing from the ground is, you know, really to say what Anna mentioned earlier, we have families that can't feed their children. We have kids that are saying they want to be able to return to school. We have girls worried they will not be able to return to school. And we're seeing a huge need. And we're only just able to resume. And many agencies are still only working on a relatively small scale because we also have to make sure that we're guaranteeing the safety for our staff as well. So huge challenges but, and, and a huge need for you to, to continue or resume operations with those challenges. Can I return to children's rights, which is centre of this, this conversation, Riz? If you could perhaps give a couple of examples of how children's rights have actually improved over the last 20 years before this um, change in dynamics, let's put it like that, and how we can prevent that work from being undone. Anna, if I can start with you. Yes, um, as I mentioned, um, we work in 17 provinces in Afghanistan, and as I mentioned in the beginning, there's been an explosion of the number of children in school, the right to education. Uh, I guess we, ha we, we had it about a couple of hundred thousand in the country in total, whereas now um, seven, eight million children are going to school. And we are one of the biggest organizations with uh, approximately a hundred thousand children in our schools. Um, so, of course, the right to education. I, I think we can't really imagine what revolution that has been. Mm. It's been a 16-fold increase mm. over 15 to 20 years. Um, we can't really understand what that means. That's amazing. In yes, itself. it's yes. amazing. Yeah. And when you ask uh, in rural areas, mm. what are your priorities for the future? Uh, it's always, res the re reply is always, we need to keep focusing on education. Uh, because as I mentioned in the beginning, we see a change where both mothers and fathers see the importance and it's it's like we've seen a change from acceptance to promotion to advocate for their children's rights to go to school both boys and girls um, now a dilemma uh, is of course that with the taliban takeover we might see other conservative norms in society taking advantage of that and try to restrict um, adolescent girls of going to uh, school. But I mean, we need to keep tackling and challenging those norms. And I know that we all are trying to do that. Uh, and another change that we actually have seen for the better, um, the last, uh, the first six months of this year, um, there was a 30 th one third of all the casualties in, of the armed conflict per se were kids. At least now, we're seeing some sort of ceasefire. Mm -hmm. uh, we might not like uh, the form of control that has been established, but at least the f armed conflict as it was before has ended. And a lot of voices that I am hearing is actually very happy about that. It doesn't mean that they're positive about the future, but at least they're relieved that the armed conflict is gone. Um, healthcare is, of course, another important um, milestone that has been reached in Afghanistan over the last, say, 15 years, uh, also for kids and children. I mean, matern the maternal health has improved. Uh, the maternal, um, uh, maternal and child health has uh, I believe it was the one of the worst case scenarios um, when the Taliban had power in the world. And now it's, I think the death rate has more than halved. So, I mean, we see a lot of improvements in the healthcare, just to take that example, immunization campaigns, um, et cetera. So um, I, I would say in every sector in society, we've seen progression. Not mm. enough, but we've seen progression, mm. and that we shouldn't forget. And even though we currently are in a state where we can't have funds transferred to Afghanistan and the cash is running out, um, we shouldn't give up because there will be a solution found pretty soon, I am sure. 
And I mean, to you who might be listening now and wondering, is my commitment or my dollars or my euros or my Swedish crown making a difference? <coughs> they are uh, supporting any organization that you find credible that works in Afghanistan. The money will find its way uh, where it will improve the lives of the civilian populations sooner or later. So, so very impressive programs in a number of key areas as educational health, as you mentioned, Anna. But then again, the prevention needs to be done now to make sure this is, this is not yeah. undone. You know, that, that's a really, really big challenge. Uh, Athena, did you want to comment on that from your perspective? You know, the, the keeping of those, the progress that has been made. Yeah, and I think I think one thing to add is that it's you know it's amazing to see this progress in the community acceptance, but it, it also contributes so widely to progress in Afghanistan and economic development. You know, before before the Taliban took control on August fifteenth, seventy five percent of public spending in Afghanistan was foreign aid funded, um, and while we absolutely need that support to continue. The, the, the hope and the plan should, of course, be for Afghanistan to be able to sustain itself, for the workforce to be empowered, for people to be able to, you know, access livelihoods opportunities, support their families without the reliance on foreign aid. And that won't be possible if we see a large rollback, especially of girls and women's rights. It will, you know, aside from being able to address the current humanitarian crisis, it would be devastating to the long term economic prospects of Afghanistan as a country if women and girls are barred from participating and barred from engaging in the workforce. So, you know, of course, we're all advocating for human rights because we, you know, we should entrench in all of our institutions publicly the importance of protecting rights, especially of those of marginalized populations. But there are huge practical implications as well that just mean that if we are going to move towards in Afghanistan that, you know, does not need to rely on the services of NGOs or humanitarian actors and for foreign aid, it's absolutely essential that we protect gains made. Mm. Thank you. Um, now, if we try and look a bit into the future, which is, of course, very, very challenging. We don't know what sits in the future, but what do you think awaits in the future? Will it be possible to continue the same type of work that both of your organizations, Save the Children and the Swedish Committee of Af Afghanistan, have been doing for a good number of years? Will it be possible? What do you, what do you think, given you know, the challenges that we, we've talked about so far? Athena, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so unequivocally, yes, but it, it depends on action that's taken now and by all of us. So I, I, I can say yes, but unless there is international solidarity, there's a global commitment to ensure the protection of all rights for populations in Afghanistan, unless funding is committed, unless diplomatic engagement that's entrenched in the protection of rights is pursued, the answer is no. So yes, we absolutely have the power to make sure that these services are continued to be delivered, that these populations are protected, that we can exercise some influence to make sure that girls and women especially have their rights protected in Afghanistan. But that depends on our action now. So to an extent, it is it is uncertain, but only uncertain if we say we have no control over this, you know, this is happening far away, we have no ability to influence. And, and the fact is, that's not true. We all have a stake in this. The protection of human rights is something that we all should be caring about, no matter where that, where that is. And the difference for Afghanistan and whether or not we're going to be able to deliver these services and whether we're going to be able to you know, continue reaching these populations is about commitments that are made now. So if we, don't, if we make sure that we don't abandon Afghanistan, if we continue to support the populations there, that's the only way we're going to see a future, especially for Afghan children, well, we have a generation that will actually be able to grow up in a society that's at peace, free from violence, and where their rights are respected. But that's not a given, and it's not something that won't happen without proactive engagement from everybody. Thank you, Athena. Anna, your, your thoughts in the, for the future for Afghanistan? Yeah, I fully share the analysis done by Athena. Um, I also want to add that Afghanistan, I mean, I mean, we're all, I think, battling between should we be pessimists or optimists? Mm -hmm. We don't know. Um, but if I should try to be a bit optimistic, um, I'd say Afghanistan is not the same country today as it was 20 years ago when the Taliban lost power. Uh, 20 years ago, there was 
basically nothing functioning in society. Um, today, as you all probably know, we've had women ministers, we have police officers, judges, uh, mothers going to work every day, uh, men promoting women's rights. Of course, it's not, not really, it's not been all uh, roses and, uh, I mean, mm. <laughs> gains, but it's been a tremendous journey for Afghanistan, uh, thanks to a very committed population. Uh, I think we all, both organizations know that working um, with Afghan staff means uh, you see an incredible commitment and a will to never give up. Um, I think we're amazed uh, every day how they keep struggling. Um, I think we're all very humble to see the willingness to do, to do something for a better future. Mm. So we have a well-educated, uh, starting to have a well-educated middle class, not like we have in here in Sweden or Europe maybe, but there is an educated middle class. Um, act promoting rights, uh, demanding rights, um, being role models. Uh, I think we should um, not forget that Afghanistan is a lot better today than it was before. Uh, and that is also something we should keep supporting. Powerful words from both of you. We have a few minutes left, so I just want to check with my colleague whether we have any questions in the chat in case we can can give them an opportunity. Oscar. Yes, uh, Peter Carlson asks you the question, what does the current ceasefire in the country mean for parents to let their children go to school? Athena, maybe. Athena or Anna, if you wanted to comment on that. Did you hear the question properly? What does the yes. ceasefire or absence of violence mean for children's rights? For parents uh, to for let parents. their children go to school. Do they feel safe, the parents, to let their children go away? I could say, yeah, I think, I seriously think as m more parents today feel more comfortable to sending their children to school. But on the other hand, you have the issue of um, food, undernourishment. I mean, it's not really sure that you send your children to school if they're not capable of going due to lack of um, proper nutrition. But in terms of absence of violence, yes, I would say a lot of families feel more comfortable, especially mm. for uh, girls' sake, mm. for their daughters. Mm. Athena, do you share that view, or do you find? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would say I would say we we definitely agree. Um, one thing I, I would flag is you know there's a ceasefire, but there are a number of armed groups active in Afghanistan, and in the last week alone, we've seen you know one or two bombings, three bombings in Kabul, and a larger bombing in Nangarhar and Jalalabad, which killed three people and wounded 20 mm -hmm. others. So, while the, the violence has, has decreased and it, in some way it's safer, it's it's still incredibly unstable, and that will of course continue to be a factor for many parents. And again, I would I would highlight the the huge number of those displaced. So whether or not parents are more comfortable sending their children to school, the large majority of those that those children that are displaced won't have access to school anymore. So regardless of whether they can go or their parents would feel safe, it, it simply won't be an option for them unless you know something is done to reintegrate them back into their communities and make sure that they're enrolled. And this goes, of course, for girls and boys. Thank you. We have, I think, another minute, so I'd just like to invite you to perhaps, for the audience who I'm sure have listened very carefully to this and probably have a lot of interest for the situation in Afghanistan, both here in the room and online, what would be your sort of top message uh, on the situation in Afghanistan? What is needed now the most? If you could pick and choose among all the complex issues that there are, what would be your sort of top message for for us Athena yeah I mean I think I think it's come up very clearly in the conversation that we've had today uh, girls you know the, the future of Afghanistan is so incredibly compromised without protection of girls and women and that has to be a priority and that's a priority that you know the, the, the public should hold your government accountable to, to make sure that when they're engaging, they are engaging from a perspective that is supporting girls and women's rights, that the Swedish government is stepping up 
to provide humanitarian funding and that for any development funding, which we know has been frozen, that they are proactively looking to make sure that they can find another way to ensure that that money can reach populations in need. We will not get far if the development assistance that's been frozen is not resumed soon. The amount of humanitarian funding we'll receive can never cover that gap. So protection of girls and women's rights, solidarity, and making sure we are proactively really looking to continue resourcing and providing support to those in Afghanistan today. Thank you, Athena. Anna, I'll give you the final word here. Yeah, I'll just add, um, soon Afghanistan will disappear from media. That's necessarily not media's fault. Um, but don't forget about Afghanistan. Uh, it's a country that's been at war for 40 years. It's been staggering with poverty, and you've heard all the challenges here in the seminar today. So don't forget that Afghanistan will be in need of support for a long, long time uh, ahead. Um, contact your local politicians and, and encourage them to contribute to a solution. Um, in, enroll in a, as a member in an organization that is active in Afghanistan. Just uh, don't forget uh, that Afghanistan is also in need of assistance. Thank you very much. And that concludes our webinar here today. I hope you found this interesting. And I'd like to uh, have a warm welcome, well, no, not a warm welcome, a warm <laughs> thank you to both Athena Rayburn, uh, Advocacy Director for Save the Children in Afghanistan, and Anna Eek, Swedish Committee for Afghanistan here in Sweden. Thank you very much for joining us. And thank you all for listening, both online and in the room here in Gothenburg. Thank you very much. Thank you.